Okay, so when Dennis walks through the door, I want you guys screaming, yelling, excitement. He doesn't know about I just did. Right. You need to do a model walk right. while we announce you. Oh, okay. right here. We've got the song going. Oh, wow. Do I have to do it? Yeah, we have to do it. 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 How much? The percentage. It's an average of 119,000 GCI. Yes. Yes. So if you guys are making an average of 119 GCI, please check the size of your database and connect with us so that we can help you get there. Okay. Thank you for sharing that one. That's phenomenal. Let's do one more before we jump into it. We've got a packed, packed day. Don't be shy. Taxes filed. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, so wait before I before I go to the next thing, I wanted to uh, quick, make sure we all understood that model award that Dan or not Dan that Dennis won, right? <laughs> um, Dan watches TV, but um, it's because of the models that he follows, right? And so that's why we again for 2023 were the number one most profitable Taylor Williams in the region. Yep. <laughs> This is Oregon as well. So 30. Oh, like Oregon, Alaska, Alaska, Idaho. Like, this is a big wow. deal. So if we're the most profitable, what does that mean to our profit share? You guys have the highest profit share. share. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we want to, what after now? Yep, we want to welcome um, everyone to the Ranch Brokerage Network. So we, if you're here, can you guys stand up? So Patty Ness, Joaquin, I saw him in the back. Um, Kenny, and we call, it's Trevino, so we call him T. Um, and then Sarah, so Henny and Sarah, husband and wife. Oh, 
I was like, oh, did I touch this? Um, Alejandro <laughs> Daria is over here in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, Thaddeus. So Thaddeus was already here, but he's now an actual agent. So anyway, congratulate him when you see him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, March Cappers, can you stand please when your name is called? Vicky, Lindsay, Hannah, I saw you somewhere in the back. Mark Van Antwerp, please stand. Jackie in the window. First listing, again, if you're in the room, stand or wave. Uh, Sheree, Cheryl, Christopher, Tony, Lauren, and Cami. Anyone in the room? First closing, please stand as well. We have Amy, Katie, Latoya, Nina, Lauren, Rasha, and Tony. Way to go, everyone. Oh, I was crowning it. My bad. Okay, so that we don't read off all these names at once. If you see your name on here, we'll give you a quick second. Please stand so that we can celebrate you. We really appreciate it. That means you have one listing, one closing, and one written in the month of March. So congrats. That's a big feat. Love it. And then the Million Dollar Club. So again, please stand. So these are the ones that had a million dollars in sales volume. So please stand, guys. <laughs> and then this is the Million Plus Club. So for the two million, Rosie, Tom, and Lori, Carla, I saw you somewhere here, Carla. Mark, Stuart, and Nicole. Can you guys stand? Please stand, oh, guys. I know. We love you.
And for teams in Kent, for units, we have Tom and Lori Kittleman, TPG Realty, and rounding off number one, we have Landman. <laughs> The group of top three units, the team that rocks, yeah. 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 and number one goes to Nicole Larson. <laughs> and for Kent, we have the results team, the Hazinga team, and number one, Rosie Rourke team. Very nice. Yeah. All right, our top closed volume for individuals, Chris, Kristen, Anthony, Christine, Jan, Anna, you are Nicole, and coming in at number one is Mr. Mark. <laughs> and in a federal way, close or woo, let me take it back in cat coast volume. We have <laughs> Hillary, Raisha, Julie, Lauren, Colleen, Adrian, Tim McQuarrie, mm -hmm. and I know this one is sick today, or else she would have been here. Number one, Jennifer Thompson. <laughs> All right, the top closed volume for teams for Federal Way, Ideal Puget Sound Homes, the Bartlett Group, and number one, Branch Real Estate. Woo! 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 And for Kent, we have Landman, and at number one, we have Tom and Lori Kittleman. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. The top closed volume in groups, number three, Nicole Larson's team. Oh. Uh, the Gelder team, and then number one, my Puget Sound Moms. <laughs> Top close volumes for groups, we have the Hazinga team, the Rosie Rourke team, and coming in at number one, we have yeah. the yeah. 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 team. All right. Can we do one big last just round of applause for everyone on yeah. Lady of the hour, come on down. <laughs> do, I, do I have anything else? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's a podium. You got a podium oh, and everything. Yeah. Susan? <laughs> Hi, friends. I had a teacher once who started every class. Hi, friends. Hi, friends. Hello, friends. Mr. Rogers. Yes. Tommy Howells. Tommy Howells. Tommy Howells. Um, so, I kind of feel like the elephant in the room is this nurse element. It's still getting a lot of questions. And um, just to caution you, you can only play that up so far, right? Just fun to play for a while. But remember that nothing um, has been approved at this time, which means that today, the way that we're doing judges and our marketplaces is how we're going to continue for the time being. When the settlement is clear in what it says, then we will have more training and information and learning opportunities around that. <clears throat> so remember that we're all working through the changes in, that may happen. And so here, I got up my crystal ball, <laughs> and here are a few things I wanted to talk to you about. So remember the timeline right now, the preliminary approval uh, court hearing, in July, um, the changes must be implemented once they're approved by the court, right? And there will be a class notice going out to potential class members. And then in August, the MLSs must implement changes. So at this time, remember, our MLS has not announced any rule changes. But what will probably happen is that we will not be allowed to publish offers to pay buyer broker compensation on the, on the MLS. And seller compensation will be decoupled from the listing firm, between the listing firm and the buyer broker firm. But here in Washington, that's already in place. A seller can offer concessions to a buyer and that's not dependent on buyer representation. Um, these can be noted in the public comments, just as always. You know, carpet allowance, uh, closing costs, that kind of thing. Um, buyer brokers must enter buyer agency agreements before showing houses. So that I think will likely change. The way it is now, it's we must have those buyer brokerage service agreements signed as soon as practical, as soon as we can. 
Uh, but I think that's going to change that they're, we're going to have to have them sign an agreement before we offer any brokerage service like showing houses. And I think that as if we are currently doing, your compensation will be disclosed on those fire agreements. And I think one fine tuning thing that's going to happen is we won't be able to say, uh, to leave an open end on the fire brokerage compensation. So in other words, you won't be able to say, I'll take whatever the seller's offering. I don't think that's going to be allowed anymore. We'll have to actually specify a percentage. And we won't be able to receive any more than is specified in the buyer brokerage service agreement. So how can you find out, find out if a seller is going to offer compensation? Well, listing brokers, website, advertising, phone call, newsletter, text, get the idea. So there will be ways to uh, get that word out. Just remember that if, you, if you're marketing, in your marketing, you cannot market other brokerages compensation for their listings on your website. I say that again. You can't market other brokerages compensation for their listings on your website. Not your secret to tell. So if it's part of like the public comments that they have published, then that's not something you can pull. Not on your website. <laughs> So no one is going to be able to really publish each other's listings then if the only way we can let people know that the seller is offering compensation well, can, is in the public spot. Right? right. But on your own website, you can put to our own or our put own, own information within our office. Right. So there were, it seems like we're really separating Keller Williams, can be Keller Williams, Windermere, Windermere. That's fun. That might, that might That's awesome. Happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so remember that as far as um, seller concession, and I know that Greg and company are going to talk about this some next week, but there aren't any anticipated changes in loan programs at this time around these potential decisions. What? Oh, you're going to talk about that. Okay, good. Good tie in there. Um, remember that loan programs don't prevent or limit a seller's ability to pay a buyer's broker. Totally separate. And in that interest of separation, you must draft your purchase and sale agreement so that concessions and compensations are completely separate. It's always been that way, but this is especially important going into um, the, the aftermath of this um, NAR court case. Remember to use form 41C if you're going to describe any variation from the seller's obligation to pay on line 17 of form 21. So on your purchase and sale, where you know either say pay is offered or other, and if you're checking other, that means you're gonna indicate some kind of a change from what is the seller is offering. Either the buyer's gonna pay some of it, you're asking the seller for more, whatever. So think of the C for change. 41 is the buyer broker service agreement. 41C is the identity used with the purchase and sale to indicate there's a change to the compensation structure from what is offered. Um, what if the seller won't pay compensation? Well, they might be willing to pay buyer closing costs if they're not paying buyer brokerage compensation, but you need to know the limit that the lender is going to allow. Um, then buyer could pay their own broker with the funds that they had designated for closing costs. Another possibility, um, and this is a little more iffy, but buyer could offer higher than asking and then the seller could pay compensation. Of course, assuming that the buyer could qualify for that higher purchase price and the property will appraise. And finally, the buyer can pay the compensation. So again, if the court approves the settlement, we will have ample time for further training, discussion, and education surrounding these issues. But I wanted to talk about it a little bit because of this um, fire agency and questions around what may happen are constituting a lot of my correspondence and phone calls right now. I'm happy to take those calls and give you all the information I got. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Perfect. That was beautiful. Any questions for for
Susan, regarding this topic? Now, it's not a question, just a comment. Right now, nothing's changed. Right. right. So, I mean, That's we can true. guess what could happen, but if you do business like we've been doing, it'd be strong and make yeah. sure that we're putting out there what the going rate is for whatever the buyer brokerages or our ops are, are getting. So, make sure that we're making our, putting our sellers in the best possible position to be able to get a decent offer. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. All right, anything else regarding that before we go into our, our panels? Awesome. Um, well, Erin and Anthony, oh no. Woo, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Do you need to walk front of the room here? That's right. Yeah. All right, you beautiful people, thank you for taking time out and hanging out with us. Can you introduce who you are, how long you've been in real estate, and uh, anything else you want to share? All right, you want to go first? I'm Anna McCluskey. Uh, I've been in real estate for 25 years. Um, and um, what, what was the last question? Sorry. <laughs> See, that's you why are, you made me do this. <laughs> what you do and how long you've been doing it? Oh, why are you doing it? How long have been doing it? How long have been doing it? 25 years. Um, and um, I love doing it, honestly. It's one of the, the best careers that I've ever had. It also is the most complicated career I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And maybe I love a pivot all the time. We got that. I like that. Is it okay if I stay seated as long as I talk really loud? I don't yeah. want to stand in the way. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you guys for being on this panel. You guys have been picked because market analysis is something you've done on the appraisal side for both of you, correct? I have never been an appraiser. So how come you know so much about it? I said Aaron and I'm Aaron Bird. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the industry for so about 21 years now. I was an appraiser first. I've been an agent, I think I'm somewhere around 15 years. And I switched over because a guy I was in classes with, I I called him one of my first appraisals since I got my license, and he was the agent. And he said, bro, you got to switch. This is way more money and way more fun. Yeah. So when the market crashed at that time, it switched over, and I really agree with him. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. That's why the prices are grumpy. Um, I am not an appraiser. I've never been an appraiser, but um, I've been through all of the short sale season of real estate. I've been through finding um, appraisals, things like that. And we've gone through many, many years where um, we really had to fight to get our price and our value with that. So what I found was by reading through my appraisals that I was able to understand the process. Now, to be clear, it's very important to say you're not an appraiser if you're not an appraiser. Um, but it's um, it's something that now I get every one of my buyer's appraisal to make sure that I'm still understanding how appraisers are appraising houses. There's some idiosyncrasies, some of them are different, but about 90% of them are appraising. How come you started that habit? What was it that made you want to really be a steward of our industry and go to that next level? I was, um, there was a, a time in real estate after 2008 that I was really fighting for value for people in their homes. And um, I found that if I understood the process and I was going to respond to an appraiser, I was winning the price contest with them, um, usually two out of three. So that was the first value. And then when I understood how they were finding that value in the house, I realized that I could price houses accurately going forward. And we were either going to come to the value that we were able to find with those appraisers without having an issue, or we could set uh, an example for our sellers to understand that they might not find it at that value if it goes up from there. And here's the steps we need to take to really get the full of the price. Do you think you want to expand on that at all? No, I think uh, the more you can understand what appraisers have that they are dealing with versus what we deal with, the better you're going to handle them because to say, oh, they just didn't see the value or this or that, you know, it, that's not going to help because they have rules and restrictions and those layer down from federal down to, so you really have, you have what's called use path, universal standards of appraisal practice. They have to abide by those. It's really broad. It doesn't even tell them how to, what report to write. I could tell you what your value is in that counts, but then you have, you know, your zoning and all those things restrict them obviously where we could have two houses in two separate zone 
but they're both single family and we don't care, right? The people look around the streets and say, ah, that neighborhood looks good, that one does too. An appraiser's got to watch that zoning more than we do. And then beyond that, you've got your lenders, and Greg can talk to that about how crazy those underwriters are. Then screw us all up. And the appraisers are getting screwed up by them too, because I will submit an appraisal at some point today, which is one day late. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> don't stop smiling. <laughs> but um, it's it's going to come back, and I know that because of how difficult that appraisal is to keep that underwriter happy. All the different things they have to look at. So the more you can learn what they deal with, the more you can try to address it ahead of time, or at least warn your client this could be a problem. There's no good surprises in real estate. No. So making everybody prepared and understanding what may happen. Um, so for instance, if you get an offer that's 50,000 above list price, but you've already done the work to show them that where the value should be. I think that appraisers generally can find 10 to 15,000 extra, something like that. They can stretch that. But once you start getting above those numbers, um, then you can just set that example for your clients to say, here's what's going to happen if the appraiser goes price. Here's our options, or here's the, the documents we, we may want to see in this offer to help make sure that that money comes in. So if you can just create a scenario for your, your sellers, and help them understand what's going to go on with it. Nobody's frustrated if it comes back that way, right? And we set every possible criteria we can legally with either the buyer or the seller in that position to make sure that ultimately our sellers win or they're prepared for with the possibilities. So, okay, so for a CMA, what are the best practices for developing your skill as an agent when it comes to CMA? What do you guys suggest or what have you, what have you learned along the way? So big. Um, well, I've taken classes with people when I first became an agent trying to understand how to, how to do this. And I heard things like three, 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 five, five, five. And that is three or five sold, five something, pending. five pending, five, yeah, five <laughs> active. I don't go by the rule. Um, <laughs> I like the rule because it includes the three things you should be looking for. Yeah. So as you're doing it, some people say you got to get three, four, five solds. I don't think you do. If the house down the street is the same design and it sold three, four months ago, job done. Ultimately, I mean that's you got it. You're you're in the area because remember we're pricing. We're not valuing. Pricing is finding where we want to present it to the market. We we know presenting a little low in a hot market works pretty well. And um, sometimes in a high market, at some markets you want to present a little higher. Your client wants to. The importance of the CMA, I think, for me is to find out where my client is. So I just did, um, I didn't even create the CMA, but I went through the comps with them on this one. And uh, I picked out the comps. It was everything I would have put in a CMA. And we went through each one individually together, looking at photos, the whole thing. So it's kind of like a walkthrough CMA. I was the CMA, I guess. <laughs> but uh, the first thing I always ask is, what do you think your house is worth? What do you think it'll sell for? And somebody taught me, I think it was Val's husband taught me that. And he just said, don't tell them what you think the house is worth until they tell you. And I almost every time will do that because I want to know where are they coming from? And then I might ask a few questions why. And I already know where my range is. And then I know whether or not, I know how the conversation is going to go. If I say top dollar, 600, there's no way it's going over that. And they say, I want 650. Okay, now I know what conversation I'm going to have. And so I think in some ways your CMA is really important for you to know what kind of conversation to have. Um, but I do agree. Find the most, think about the buyer, the most similar house that's on the market or just recently sold uh, or is pending. And then kind of work out from there is what I tend to do. Because that's, that's the one that's the best alternative to this house. Right. And I go for that. And call on your pendings. Call every agent, see if they'll give you some information. Yeah. Every one of them. I think I do it a little bit differently. Um, I, I definitely have that same question where in the, my listing presentation, because your market valuation is just part of your presentation, right? And so in my listing presentation, one of my questions is, you know, what do you think the value or what are you hoping to get? And you want an agent or a broker to clarify that number for you, right? Or help you get there. And so, and then you said quietly, do not answer that. Do not start to lead them into a conversation with them because most people will apologize and say like, so, I mean, I saw it on Zillow. 
So they have an idea, but it's right because your conversation next for your pricing <clears throat> can help you understand. Do you know that you already either beat that price, you can match that price? I don't do a range. Um, I'm very specific on the price that we go in at um, because the numbers, if you're doing it similar to what Aaron's doing as uh, a pricing analysis, you're going to come with a very clean number. One is I don't have to fight about price with people. I never do. It's a repeatable, proven system that works. Um, and two is that we have a very, very clear number. So if people go above or below or anything like that, we know exactly what we should be able to get with the understanding that there may be some houses sold within that time range that might be added to that market. Um, so again, with like the same thing as you, if I know if the market's really hot and moving, I might say, hey, we can probably sneak in about five to 15,000 above, kind of depending on what the house looks like. Um, but they understand that that price was very, very clear with those. So um, if you want to learn about CMAs, my class is this Thursday. Great plug. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, Southless. <laughs> Let's go ahead. Tomorrow. I will be here for that. <laughs> I, I agree. I like, I like to ask them what they think their home is worth. But more than not, my experience has been they say, well, that's your job. What do you do with that? Say, thank you. I'm glad you trust me. That's it. That's awesome. That's awesome that they're coming in saying that's your job, really, because then they're saying, I'm trusting you to just give me that number. I have no idea. Um, and uh, I don't hear that that often, but that would be a great lead in for like, that's great. I have brought a lot of data to show you what it is, right? You've already done that work. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So, tomorrow, <laughs> 11 to 1, tell me that's right too, right? Um, and um, it'll be really great. It'll be a workshop style, so you can do that. And you, you one of the questions though that you ask is, how do you get familiar with her? What's the best way to do it? Is that what your yeah. leading question was? Um, doing them. So my the Sorry, greatest repeat thing. That. I know that sounds funny, but just for doing them. Okay. Which is Perfect. a great Perfect. marketing thing. So if you are either been in the business for 10 to 15 years, or you are a brand new agent, what an opportunity to say, I have a brand new system to get the value for your home that's uh, proven to be accurate. Would you like to give it complimentary? Can I use your house as a complimentary like market valuation? And so you can just throw that out to people and do as many as you possibly can in that week. So if you've been in the business for a while, now you're in that conversation with people. And if you've never done one before, it's a great opportunity to be in that conversation with people. Well, and like you shared earlier, not only does it help you when you build your listing side of your business, but it protects your buyers so that you know what you should be offering and if something is off. Instead of just going with a feeling or an opinion, you can actually do like the reverse engineering of a CMA and figure out how they came up with that, right, on the buy side. I just used that last week. I got $15,000 level list price for a house Amazing. Uh, by doing market valuation for them. Figured out they were very well overpriced. Um, and graciously, I think that that's one of the things too, is graciously presented it to the, to the seller's agent and tried to make sure that I um, presented that without being rude about it. But here's where we came in. Here's what we're thinking. We kind of met in the middle of mine and, and theirs. Um, and then uh, same thing with your, if you're fighting an appraisal, please do not go in there and try to tell the appraiser like how bad they were. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's <laughs> Please come in graciously and yeah. find the three new comps. Use the same system that they did, which is exactly how. So if you if you see he adjusted square footage for this, you know, amount per square foot, do the same thing with your three new comps and bring those three new comps in. You're not just throwing three comps at them. You're not saying, hey, I just want you to use these ones and they're 10 miles away, right? Like you're going to have to use those the understanding of how they're appraising houses in order to win those. Any questions so far, you guys? Yeah. <clears throat> so at what point would you go about that? Like, obviously, if you find there's a discrepancy in the listing price, you've probably been appraised. So if it comes in as a little appraisal, you're going to go ahead and um, ask for two. What's the word for that? Reconsideration. Thank you. Uh, and, then, and then what would you do after that? Well, with the reconsideration, you have to, the thing about changing an appraisal price is you're going to have to come in with some actual hard data that proves they made an error or missed something that was big. 
And, you know, 21 years doing that, I think I've changed 10 Can appraisals. Can you give an example of what's like a hard one? Yeah, for example, this was years ago, and um, I appraised a property, was in a difficult area, and um, it was in a really prestigious neighborhood up in Bellevue, and I appraised it, and it came in low, and everything made sense. Well, then the agent was able at that time to be able to contact me through, you know, the lender and all that, and uh, yeah, those are kind of nice days. Um, so... She explained to me that one of the sales that I'd done, there's nothing wrong. I drove by the house. Everything looked great. It was a distressed sale. There was a divorce going on and they fire sold that house. And she knew the whole story, the whole situation. And then that one was dragging down the comps. And so she actually helped me by showing me another property that was a great alternative. And I said, well, and once I, and this is like 15 years ago, so I'm some of it's money, but the situation was there was a sale. I didn't know the conditions. I didn't know why it was there, but it was right there on the street. So it made that street look like it was worth less in that neighborhood. And so I was able to take a look around. And when I eliminated that comp and used another one that was sufficient, it changed the value and it worked out. So that's usually it. Um, well, I have a class <laughs> about appraisal and we do go into, it's different than what she does. In fact, I recommend all the time when people want to talk pricing during that class, it's not specifically we're going too deep into it. I actually tell people you got to get up to Anna's class. But I do have a class where we talk about how to how to provide things so that you can avoid the low appraisal in the first place. Mm -hmm. At least how to communicate. One great one, I always give an example. I caught on myself as an appraiser, but it was a pie-shaped lot. And the house was kind of on this, the big part of the pie was out on the street on a corner. And the house was pushed up into the back and their backyard was about half the size of this room at an angle. And it was clear that that was a weird shaped lot. But if, if an appraiser is rolling through doing five, six appraisals at a time, they may miss something like that if it's right next to the other house. And then next thing you know, you've got a, an issue. If you can go through and see those potential issues and bring them to the appraiser ahead of time through an appraisal packet at the house that they used to leave it there, then um, that'll help a lot too. Help them miss, you know, not miss little things. Why is having a strong skill set around a CMA so important right now? Or ever? I can say that one. Presentation, I think, is huge right now. That's what I personally am focused on it all throughout my business, is going back to presentation because there's a lot of comp competition around listings right now. And uh, there's compensation issues. There's the market down, you know, as far as the volume, all of that. And there was times where I got away with, I think I went three years without even pulling out my presentation. And it was just natural. I walk in, I immediately go start learning about the house, talking to them. We're just conversating throughout the whole thing. And then we do pricing. But for me personally, I think right now, having packaging really helps a lot rather than just coming across as the guy or the girl who just kind of comes in winging it and wearing flip-flops or something. What, so. Eric, what Eric means is it's your value as a professional. Yep. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> and it is. And that's, I think that that's, um, when we walk through the door as, I mean, I'm going to show up sometimes in jeans or whatever I'm going to wear at the moment. And, you know, driving up 350. All and day. All day. <laughs> and, and the truth is, is that, our professionalism right now is incredibly important. And one of the reasons that I say um, about the market valuation class is, guess what? Every single person out there thinks that the appraiser is a professional, right? But they don't think that we are. So until we know how to price a house and how to be very clear on it, by using similar systems to most of the appraisers, then we do not have, we are not professionals. We are coming in and we are doing guesswork. So that's easy. That's easy. So when we come to the, the market analysis and going through the expectation conversation around price adjustments, days on market, things like that, how in advance do you start those kind of conversations with your sellers? Really getting into the pricing? Yeah, just, um, you know, with the market changing, it's not like it sells with no sign in the yard at this point, right? I, I don't have... A clear path to that conversation. Uh, everyone's different. I think it has to do with how I meet them, the relationship. I met some people in open house in December and they didn't respond to my follow-up at all. 
They just said, oh, we'll reach out to you when the time's right. I'm sure you did. And they did. And then they had already decided that they were going to use me. I don't know what it was. So we didn't get into pricing until my second meeting. I went to their house, got to see it, got to know it. Um, I personally like a two-step in that way because I want to walk through your house and see what I can't feel regardless. So I will do research before my first appointment. Real quick, go deeper on what the two-step is. Oh, okay. Two-step is where I go up there and I meet them. I prefer that first step to be at their house because I'm going to do research. I'm going to have all my stuff. Everything's ready to go. I've got everything. I can make it a one step, you know, and I can do everything in one meeting. But I usually find that uh, people want to talk about the house, talk about the market, talk about their plans and get to know them. Even if I've done that on the phone, I'm in their house. I, I guess maybe it's because of my background being an appraiser. I feel like if I haven't walked through your house, I can't truly value it. Because I, I don't know, I've seen so many thousands of houses where I've walked in going, ah, oh, crap, everything I just prepped for was wasted, right? This is totally different than I thought. So my first step is more about getting to know them through conversation most of the time and walking around their house. And we start talking about what they should or shouldn't do to their house sometimes this last time. And then I say, great, now that I've seen your house, I have a bunch of research. I want to redo that and be more specific to your house. And then that's where I've got them either at the office or back at their house or somewhere. And we're going through the CMA because then I can dial it in. Yeah. yeah. That's my style. And how about you? How do you handle expectations when it comes to pricing and market analysis with your clients? I'm a one stepper. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and so I do come with a market valuation, but I actually <clears throat> stick the price behind the whole thing because if I come in and it's a shit show, excuse my language. I mean, you know what I'm going to do, right? But it's also got some things, some aspects that I did not know about that I'm excited about or that we can maybe improve as we're going up. So the one step is very similar to yours, actually, because you've already done the work ahead of time to have your price. Um, and then I'm going to go back and say, you know what, I've got to make some adjustments to this or let's go ahead and get this, um, you know, repaired or whatever. But my final step is that... I'm going to let them know that we're going to make adjustments two days before we list and I'm going to reevaluate because um, my favorite word to people is we're going to get less every last week. I love that. Smart. It's, yeah. a, it's a super simple statement, but people really want that. Um, and so we just we reevaluate. And sometimes I do prepare them. Maybe the market is shifting in a, in a downward direction. It's slowed down. Rates are changing every single week. And we can see this week was a little slower than for instance last week, right? So um, we're going to do that and make adjustments based on your current active homes. And we already know what you can probably get maximum in an appraisal at this point. And we have some competition out there that may be starting to be starting to do price increases and we can actually up it five or ten thousand dollars and or we maybe have to look and say, hey, we need to be five thousand below your, you know, the best comp out there. So we're going to adjust that set expectations for that. Like that. Any questions, you guys? Yes. Uh, what's the consideration for off proper off market properties that are sold? Um, you got uh, that one. That was good. Yeah. I uh, my personal opinion is I take a look at everything because an off market property can sell at market value. It doesn't mean it's not going to. I don't consider it initially. But if it fits into where everything else is making, if it makes sense according to the other comps, it's fine to use it. But I would never use it as an anchor for a value. More supplemental. That's my opinion. What do you think? Oh, it was the same. We were talking about it in the women's room this morning. And there's three comps in a neighborhood. One's off market but sold for 100000 less than the other one. So we were... Usually, they usually, they usually do. It's right, but right back to you. On that. Yeah. I did do a probate appraisal last month where I was there was nothing, and that I used an off-market property. But then when I adjusted for condition and everything, this is in 2021 too, and everything's nuts. You can, you know, literally, you can say, "I'm selling my house," and seven realtors and buyers can show. And so it actually did sell at market value, but it was still supplemental just to fill out the report. And if you're lacking comps, if you have one of those, you can throw it in because then you can speak to those situations too. I guess the other thing that I was saying is you were talking that there was three ones low and it's off market. 
I feel like an appraiser is going to have to find anywhere from four to eight comps. Mm -hmm. So they're going to find something else as well that might still be supplemental, but just understand they're going to have to keep searching for more than just the two that are on market or yeah. were on market. So question just might help some other people, but uh, what do you give the most weight to when you're doing your CMA that's in like location, oh, man, zero, oh. square footage, or four single five? You found me right. I love it. Thank you for that question. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Give me half hour to answer it. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, well, okay, let's start with sell, sold or not sold. Well, as an appraiser, you have to wait the sold comps. So keep that in mind. But you have pending comps, and you're not listing for two to three weeks or maybe a week. I, as an agent, I'm waiting the pending comps if I get information on what that contract is. Because if that contract is higher, Cool. We know that's about to close, and you know you ask the questions: Is are you close to close? Are you good? And all that. If somebody will give it to you. So if I have the information on the pendings, and that's a good comp, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait that because that's the future. But um, I'm also gonna want to time my uh, appraiser until after that closes too. <laughs> so a, as an appraiser, you're gonna wait the solds. As an agent, you're also gonna make sure that you understand the active and the pendings yeah. and wait those. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then. <laughs> Design style, I think. Well, you have location. Everybody, so huh, this one I get all the time. Well, that's outside my neighborhood. I'm like, yeah, well, nothing in your neighborhood that's similar sold. So, yeah, and we're going over here. <laughs> and you'll notice those neighborhoods sell for about the same price. They have the different builder sometimes, all that. I really look at, obviously, location matters closer to it inside the neighborhood. But after you can get to that, it's design style. If you have a split entry, you know, please don't give your appraiser a tri-level, you know, or a two-story. But if you have a two-story and the tri-level is all above grade, go ahead and give them the tri-level. It might work sometimes. So there are differences, but if you got a split entry, please use split entries for your comps whenever possible, things like that. One and a half and two-story, go ahead and use both of those too. But if that makes sense, and then square footage, of course, but then it gets down into the other little things like garage count, all that is lesser. For square footage, what is your range? For county, don't do it. It's not a broad one. So for county, you mean King and Pierce, square footage. And so well, no, not, not for like if you're putting oh. in a range. Oh, okay, and say oh. it's fifteen hundred square feet. Oh, okay. Your comps. Okay. How? What are? What is the range of homes that you would take into consideration okay. above or below? Oh, what you're for? I think it really depends. <laughs> so if, if you have nothing within two miles, um, that's a good comp. That's not within a thousand square feet difference. Then I would work within those two miles before I would worry about the square footage as it just just the square footage. So it really depends on what you have available. So like for instance in this market when I'm doing the CMA lately, it there's some areas that are impossible to find comps, right? And now I'm having to spread out. So maybe I'm doing way more adjustments on square footage than I normally would. Uh, I think that we to me to answer your question, the, the bigger criteria to me are the same. It's gonna be style within two miles if I can, if I have to spread out further than I will, but I also understand an appraiser route, right? Um, and and then obviously I'm gonna make the adjustments from there. Um, but, you know, I, I, like you said, I'm not gonna put a split level with a single story. I've never ever seen that on an appraiser. Not so, um, and just understand that like, if Aaron goes out of those criteria, he's gonna write notes on that. So it's he'd rather find them within those criteria because if he has to do something that's kind of an anomaly to add <coughs> to that, he's gonna have to write like a little dialogue on that. And who wants to do that? So we, you know, if you can stick with those, if you have to stretch out, understand an appraiser would have to as well. Yeah, and in fact, that's a good point. Going back to uh, design style, if there are no design style within one or two miles of that, and you're going outside Pretend to find I'm really just not the smartest one. Okay. The heck is a design style? A design style. Okay, I'm not talking about colonial versus craftsman. <laughs> that's important in some ways, but first of all, is get one story, two story, split entry, tri level. That stuff worked out because you're looking at design style. A colonial versus a craftsman, yeah, they're very different, and that's not like, ooh, I like the pillars and all that, or I like the, you know, whatever. So um, that's nice, but at the same time, you have utility. So think, if you're lost, think utility. How many bedrooms does it have? How many bathrooms does it have? About how much square footage does it have? You know, that utility and functionality of the house, even though they're a design style 
you know, colonial versus craftsman style, at least you've got same utility. That would be a good start there. And if you have hard time out there, then yes, if, you, if you've got your one story, go ahead and use a two story comp if the square footage is similar. So at least you can kind of have something nearby that it doesn't match up with what you're doing outside of there too. We're getting into like, that's, so? that's for class. So, well, if, remember we're agents. We're trying to find a price, not a value too. We're talking price here. So are you guys, are you guys picking up that pricing at home, right? Doing a CMA. It is an art, not a science. Yeah. You're hearing all of these nuances, right? Of it could be this or it could be that, right? This is by practicing. I feel so weird sitting down and talking to you guys. Come up here and stand up. Hi, yeah, hi. Okay, so but this is why practicing is so important. And I do not mean that you finally sat in your first listing appointment and you're practicing on your very first client. Mm -hmm. What I mean is all of us have homes that we can practice on each other. You can go in, like she was saying, a great touch to your database to reach out and say, hey, you're on my list for a CMA this month. Is there any but or any upgrade that you've done to your property that I'm not seeing since you bought it? This is where you practice, right? So John Maxwell says it takes how many hours to master? 10,000. Now let's talk about each individual hour because I think that gets overlooked. How many of you guys, show of hands, are an athlete, a musician, or an artist? What? <laughs> you guys did one of those activities, right? So, yeah. Hold it way back. Way back. But the point was, is you guys knew at the beginning, you had to go through the fundamentals. And regardless of being brand new at something or being a professional, you never got away from the fundamentals. You practiced it every day, whether you wanted to or not. This is a part of what we need to be doing. This is the fundamental of your business to protect you and your clients and to, to add to your value proposition so that you have a career that's steady and strong regardless of what the market's doing or regardless of what people are trying to do to our industry. We get to control this. This is our narrative. We should own it. So if you aren't practicing and getting closer to that 10,000 hours, if anything that you guys heard today went over your head or felt overwhelming, please run to developing this skill. Please be at her class tomorrow, Wednesday. She's going to be able to go through specifics of how you go through pricing a home, right? How you go through a CMA in detail. And then you guys can take that and start practicing with your sphere of influence, with your fellow agents and things like that. This is, this is a non-negotiable, you guys. It really is so important because this is the bread and butter. And one other thing to say to that is that most of your agents, if you've got competition out there, are coming in with three or four houses off of the MLS on like a portrait report. I can tell you right now, if you have a market valuation, no matter how good or bad it is, it's still above a deal. Yeah. Yeah. I recommend taking your class often because it's a workshop. You're not. Most classes, you're just sitting there watching and listening, and you can watch and listen to class a few times. But hers is a workshop. Yeah. And then as markets change, you're gonna in, as you have different houses, you're gonna have different questions each time. It's gonna be a learning experience each time, and so that's why I recommend taking. What do you use to do your market valuations? I use Cloud CMA. It is a complimentary oh gosh, service from Keller Williams. And it's RBN complimentary Network. through our office. Yeah. You know what's cool about it too is you can do print out one. You can do all kinds of stuff on it. And you can take it, you can set it up to where you can go to the MLS and select your comps and hit send to cloud CMA. Yep. It's cool. Yep. And then you have your techie people who like screens. And so it has a version where you can just kind of have them swipe through a screen too. Yeah, yes. I did it just for a couple of Not only are you doing this for your listings, but you're doing this for your buyers. Correct. Correct. All the time. For yeah, buyers. good point. All the time. So to validate the pricing. Yes. And we found that the other is true. So when I just told you that I had one that I knew it was overpriced and we were able to get a, a reduced price on that um, as the buyers. The other way that we've done that too is they can come in and say, I just don't feel like this is right. And I can make sure that they feel very good about the price that they're offering. For things. Or if they're going to go above and beyond, we can set an expectation about what we think that this is going to probably appraise at. Now, understand this is an estimate for me. It's not an estimate from him on an appraiser, but it's an estimate for me, right? But also, if it goes above and beyond, are you prepared for that? Are you going to come in with cash, right? What do you think you could probably get to on the top of this house? And you have this cash to be able to cover that in a 22 AD or an addendum that guarantees that you're going to pay it for it. Question here. I've taken both classes, both were excellent, highly recommended. I read a lot of my parents' class just recently. 
Uh, one thing you do mention about the, like a, a ramp or one level of security intersection, always have a ramp with price to spur for more based on zone. It's the same. And I, you know, I, you took my class, you know how I feel about price per square footage. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. You're doing it based on price per square foot for adjusting for the square footage, but you're adding all the, the other components that are so it's it's asked in my class a lot. How, uh, why is it that when I look online, it's 239 bucks per square foot, and then what you're telling me is it's 60 bucks per square foot for the difference between you and oh, yeah. right? Because Aaron is, for instance, taking the difference for each component of the house. It's not just like this broad overview that includes somebody's like 20, 20 acre lot plus their house, plus yeah. this. He is comparing it apples to apples with something. And each component is comparable. So it's not going to be like what you see on Zillow where it says it's, you know, 391 bucks a square foot or whatever. Yeah. And I just don't go buy it. I've, it's inconsistent because you can have the same house in the same neighborhood and it's a hill. And this one can see Mount Rainier and this one can't. Price per square foot for this one is much higher than this one. So there's just, if you start with price per square footage, you can get totally out of whack. I always go towards... Um, well, valuation is the most probable price somebody will pay for a similar house, yes. right? The, what is, that's what comparables are. This house compares to this one, all right? So once you do that, you'll see a range of price per square footage, and it probably will be pretty tight. So when you're talking about the ramp results, I always told you that the foundation and the job size, they tend to be valued more. Oh, per square foot? I think that's true. I don't really yes, pay attention but, to but that. But when you're doing a valuation, you're doing, uh, you know, ranch to ranch to ranch. Yes. So that's not going to matter anymore, right? Because you're doing the same style of house, which is a ramble or a ramble. I was referencing to it. It talked about the convenience style. Um, that's why it's kind of I went. Yeah, that's getting pretty deep. Yeah, as an agent, be nice not to mix styles. I do uh, because of my appraisal background. And like, for example, the appraisal I'm late on. Um, <laughs> sorry, everybody. It happens. Hey, I'm still early on their closing. I know that, but I, I feel bad whenever I don't hit my deadline. But um, it's a very difficult one, and that's the problem. I had to go back out this morning and spend an hour and a half driving all over Bonnie Lake and some other places taking pictures of houses because I have to drive by each one. Now, as an agent, I also recommend, whenever possible, drive by the houses, because you'll know why one sold for less by looking at the neighborhood, too. But in that, I'm having to use a variety of designs. There's, it's a unique property, its condition is not great, and it's, it's tough. So sometimes you gotta just do what you gotta do, and you, you know. probably have about 15 other options before then, yeah. unless you've eliminated them, and then you can start mixing styles yeah. and stuff like that. So I would say find as many possibilities within a reasonable scope before you start doing that, because it's most likely an appraiser's time. Right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. like Fortunately. elite yeah. level. So being both of you, agent and going, um, I was curious on how often would you meet the appraisal if you have a different I said, I'm just asking because if I, don't have one, I don't understand the question. <laughs> so what the question is, is, is do you ever ask, meet the appraisal doing it? Oh, the appraiser? appraiser? Yeah. Boy, uh, ever? Uh, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to disagree on that one. <laughs> you, start, uh, you start crossing weird, weird lines then. You can leave them an appraisal and, and or your value estimated valuation, right? So, um, I, in fact, I sometimes very respectfully, I just leave a note. I'm, I'm sure you, I know you have all these things. I left these just in case. Um, and a lot of times they use my comps as long as they see that I had integrity about them. Does that make sense? But sometimes it's gonna save them some time as well. Also just understand they don't have to, because they're professionals. They're gonna do what they're gonna do, right? So if I can help to assist them in that process and we can all come to an agreement, that's great. But it's it gets very weird. Um, it's almost like if you had the seller at home while you're trying to do an inspection. It's just too weird. Get out, right? So I wouldn't see them that often. Yeah, I think it comes across as needy. Just from my own experience in the past when people, especially if you're the buyer's agent, if you're the buyer's agent, and you show up to an appraisal, I just, I'm like, there's something wrong with this transaction. Because yeah. <laughs> I've had it happen so many times. And that doesn't mean that's you. 
you might just try to be giving the, the best service ever. I'm just telling you from their perspective, that's what it comes Did across as. Crumpy little permits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, if you want to know more about that, Greg and I in our class uh, on appraisal, we do go over in detail what I personally recommend to leave as a packet and how to handle the appraiser from start to finish. And you do end up with uh, takeaways for you and your clients on the appraisal process of how to how to best manage that part of your transaction too. So we go way into that. Any other questions or anything that I haven't asked you that you guys want? One other question. Just use cloud CMA. Just use cloud CMA. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron really oh, yes. Or what you just said, I have a comment, but I'm, that's too much work, so I'm not going to let you. I have some simple off the top. Are you related to Dave? Dave. Dave. David. Bird? No. No. One's Bird. One's Bird. Yeah, that's it's B. Mine's B Y R D. His is B E R G. I was uh, hoping Larry Bird, but his is. <laughs> I need a rich uncle. <laughs> There's so much work to do on that Larry Bird. <laughs> uh, I don't have one scheduled yet, but Greg and I are working on three or four different locations that we're trying to get some things going. Aaron, to mine, it's, his is less of a workshop and more of a like get together, hang out with other agents, ask questions, and he's going to answer a lot. Is that right? We we There's take you. Oh my gosh! It's, yeah, it's about an hour long yeah. class, and then we try. We try. To save the questions till the end, but you're a bunch of agents, so you know questions come <laughs> randomly. <laughs> but um, <laughs> trying to manage it, but it's really in depth. In fact, Greg's section is about a half hour long of this, and it is going way into the underwriter and dealing with that. And we really seek to help you understand and bridge that gap between appraisal and agent. And understand, most appraisers I know they are the grumpy hermits, but they're not there to blow up your deal. There are those that give crap on anybody. But that's, that's really not the ones I know personally that I've met. That's nobody's intention because they don't want to deal with you guys coming back and blowing up their day. Well, an appraisal's reasonable duty to prove to that the value is there. So if we get hot offers that are above and multiple offers and people are willing to spend the money, it is not the appraiser's fault if that value does not come in right. They have to give you, they have a reasonable duty to find the value based on the sold comparables, right? You can't get mad at somebody for that. We're all professionals. We uh, need to prepare our clients. If that doesn't happen, here are the options. And here's what we're going to do with our offer to try to make sure that you get to that value. But understand that they are being professionals and doing the right thing in most cases. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Round of applause for your time today. Before we get into the next one, so Pam is also on her way. We need you guys to stay at least till one. She also has a surprise. Okay. Yes. People absolutely. Well, you should. There's food for those. We also have our. We're moving. Okay, we already got that out. Oh, So we do have a referral contest. Who was here last week when we soft launched it? Yeah. Uh, you know, we assume so. It was a soft launch. You know. So on here, you have a chance to win a thousand dollars. Who would like an extra thousand dollars? Me. Cash. Say pass or cash? Cash. Oh, a cash. <laughs> that was a cash. Yes. There's some cash. So how does this work? You have to put in the QR code and send your information through there. Can you call Dennis, Pam, Lindy, or Melissa, or Billy? No. no. And give us to that. No. no. More importantly, please do not bother the ranches with a referral like this for this competition. We have a system in, in place, and we want to make sure you guys get accounted for. Okay? So if you text us, if you email us, if you smoke signal us, it will not count towards $1,000. So everyone tell me, what do you have to do to be put into this contest? Give the QR code. Perfect. There's a section in here that says, do they know we're reaching out? Mm -hmm. Should we tell them maybe that we're going to get a random call? Yeah. Should we make it a warm introduction? This QR code has been deactivated. Okay. So another thing that we want to be uh, putting in front of you guys is that this is for a licensed referral. These are not case for referral. Do we have any questions around that? No. Nope. Okay. Excellent. 
So, Miss Emma, are you fixing it, Em? I am letting so, so we're going to fix this and we're going to put it on the Facebook page. Yep. Yep. Everyone should have also received a text message. Who didn't receive a text message? No, last, last, week. Week. last week. Did you guys receive a text message with a link on it? No. If you didn't, let us know. So all of you should already have the link if you were texted. Candace, you, you and Michael should have got it together. We'll, we'll check on them. I know for a fact. So does K-score count? <laughs> No, no, no. No, they have to be what? Licensed. Actively licensed. Yes. Can you send it straight to Lindy? No. No. Can you send it straight to Billy? No. Perfect. Only you. Or you can still build your profit that way. You, just won't get it. you will <laughs> yes, you will not be entered for the thousand dollars. Are there any is there any confusion? No. No. The next thing is this ends April 19th at 4 p.m. If you send it to us at 401, does it count? No. Profit share, yes. Count for the thousand dollars. No. A little louder, everyone together. No. No. Thank you. Is there any other questions on it? I want to make sure it's super clear and no one's confused. Did somebody actually win last week, or we just we soft launched it? So we told you this is what we're doing, <laughs> and now what about the official one? they will still count. They will still count. They will still count. We are hard launching it today, which means we're starting it again today, putting it in front of you but everything that was put in last week still counts. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What if they're licensed in another state they're moving to Washington? That counts. It's still licensed. So are they moving here? Are they licensed? No, yeah. no that's okay. I mean, they're they're not not licensed. It's still case for though. Oh, they're not licensed here? No, no they're, they're, they're not licensed here, they don't count. Because they'll still have to get their Washington state. If they're from another state and also licensed here, you can hear it. Don't make it confusing, sir. <laughs> Put it away. <laughs> Go to the next one. Perfect. <laughs> All right. How many of you guys, show of hands, please, have already attended one of the value squares? That's really good, but the problem is this is a mandatory class. So, for those that have not raised your hand, you have one more opportunity to fulfill that requirement. It's going to be the 25th. This is live, done in Gary's personal office. Um, and so, for those that have already taken this, I do advise you take it again. I've sat in on all of them. Because you're going to get something different out of it. But this is mandatory for agents within RBN. Do we have any questions? Yes. Dennis. My question is, for those that have our experience in this room that took this class. What did you get out of it? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Lots of stuff. I'll tell you what I do when it comes to trying to get the compensation for the buyer. I took it directly off the slides, and I think I shared it with Carly yesterday. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what it right. is is when we say, okay, here's option number one. If you're going to take full compensation, you are going to get the most amount of exposure, blah, blah, blah. Here's option number two. You can negotiate it, but there will be certain buyers I VA that will not be able to come and take a look at the possibility. I want you to understand you're taking that risk. Yeah. Third window. So it's very good. It's pre printed. I have my seller initial. What do you want to do? Smart. I just need to make sure that you are uh, full aware of that. <coughs> and then also, there's like the first three steps of why we do the buyer's agent or why it's good for us as a selling or listing agent, whatever, to have a buyer's agent and selling agent. And it goes through exactly the pre printed there. They help negotiate, and I bring that to my clients too. Okay. Time okay. out. Time out. How long have you been in business? Time out. Thirty-six years. Thirty-six years. Thirty-six that years, and she still learns something yeah. out of this. Yes, yeah. you learn a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Find your skills. Same thing with Anna. It's the same thing here. Are you going to be an old man? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, it changes everything. It changes our verbiage. It changes our outlook. Cooperating compensation is a key word. It's cooperating. I mean, it changes everything. I'm a listing agent. That's all I do. I don't like to be a buyer's agent. I don't have the time for it. I don't have the patience. But they are cooperating <laughs> agents that we need to work with. So how you look at that and how you present it in your presentation really is going to determine whether your market analysis is valid or not. Because how soon are you going to sell for how much and which amount of time? I just wanted to make a, a general comment. This is going to be anonymous, but I want to say that I'm always inspired by real estate professionals, especially within our company, who decide they're going to compensate a buyer's agent above what is expected because they recognize their value. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yes. 
sometimes we're the worst, I just want to say. Anybody who's selling for sale by owner their own house, talk to me. <laughs> the reason this is mandatory is because we want killer loans people to be the best out there, yeah. period. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. 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 And it says it's three hours, but it's really one or two. Yeah, it's not the whole time. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is your last opportunity to get it. Yeah. It's four hours, but it's never been four hours. No, it has not. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Anything else regarding value squared? Okay, perfect. I took the values word, or I watched one of them. It was great, by the way. And one of the things Gary recommends is working really closely with your lender. I wholeheartedly think you should be doing that. So uh, anybody feel like pivoting is happening at a more rapid pace right now? Yes. Yeah. Like we don't, we don't really, it's every day. Um, thank you for saying that because the reality is, is in order to stay on top of this market, you have to learn something new about the market every single day. <laughs> I'll give you an example. You're going to hear on Thursday, rates now are close to 7.5%. The reason you're going to hear it on Thursday is because the media uses the Freddie Mac report, which comes out on Thursdays. The report is done on Mondays, though. So if you look at the Mortgage News Daily report, which is what sometimes you see that post on Instagram, that's 7.5% today. Last week, it was like 6.8, yeah. right? So that's a big difference. You're talking about your clients. If you have a buyer that you're, that's in your car right now, in the last week, they have lost 5% of their buying power just in the last week. So then you have to ask yourself, like, am I staying on top of my game for my clients? If you're listing right now, you might be looking at the last three houses in the neighborhood got multiple offers and closed in the last month, but rates weren't seven and a half, right? So maybe that home is going to sit if you now list that at what these other homes closed at with multiple offers, because you might be taking some of the buyers out of the market and giving you less exposure just because of the rates. It's super, super important to stay informed. The biggest difference between the top producers in the room and the people who aren't maybe selling as many homes they want is the top producers pivot and make changes as things happen in real time. The top producers are, are because they're selling more homes. It's okay. She doesn't want to hear about rates. <laughs> So, like that, that right there is how I feel every time I pull up the rate sheet and I look at it. Right? I want to try as well, totally understand. So, but my point is, is that's the difference. I really, I've been doing this for 20 years, and what I've seen the difference between top producing lenders, real estate agents, and people who maybe are not where they want to be is the ability to pivot, the ability to take change and implement it right away. You know, obviously there's teams that they have more people working on it, but there's things you can do as an individual agent too. Pay attention to what's going on with rates. Be in constant communication with your client's lender to make sure that, hey, I was looking today at rates. It looks like they went up a quarter percent. Is Mr. and Mrs. Smith still qualified for what we're looking at? Like, this is all super, super important, guys, because I don't, I mean, I don't want you to lose. I just don't want you to lose. I don't want everybody to be like professional drivers. That's Uber, and you can actually get paid for that. I don't want you to be professional offer writers because you don't get paid for that. Come on. We're not working for free. This is not, I don't know, social work. We're trying to help people achieve their dreams. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that if my client says they want this house, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure they get that house. And that's not what's happening out in the market right now. I can tell you because as a lender, I get deals coming across my desk from all different brokerages. And I get a lot coming across my desk every single month. So I get a wide swath. And what I can tell you is most of your competition sucks. <laughs> sucks. There is no room like this. They're not learning. They have no idea. 
they're out there. I'm saying, hey, your client's putting 50% down. You can waive their appraisal as long as you write in the contract, right? And you still want to get the appraisal, blah, blah, blah. This isn't think about that, okay? You can waive that appraisal. Well, that's one thing you can waive, right? Some people literally don't know that. It's okay if you don't know that. I'm here to offer my services. I'm here to offer Debbie's services. I understand in a group setting, most people are not gonna raise their hand and say, I don't understand the 2280. I don't understand how I could potentially waive financing, waive appraisal for my clients. None of you guys are gonna admit that because you're afraid you're the only one that's gonna raise your hand. I promise you, 90% of the people in this room could learn something from a call with a lender about how we could waive something to make our clients offer stronger, okay? So please text me, call me, walk into Debbie's office. Let's talk about some strategies that can help your clients win so we can help them achieve their dreams and we can achieve our dreams. Okay. Yes. Let's go. Everybody in the kitchen, come in if possible. Opportunities. So Brandy's going to share a little bit about the link tree that's going to be coming and how you can sign up for things and all that good stuff. And then we actually have a special guest today that I'll share after you share about the link tree. Yeah. 
Sure. So in the uh, Red Day event that is in the Facebook group, there is a link that takes you to our link tree. There is swag. So if you don't have a shirt, you can buy one there and some of the proceeds will go to Keller Williams Mountain Sound Care. And then all of the opportunities are broken down by the organization. So if you're helping um, the multi-service center, there is an opportunity to go to their food bank or you can donate at any of our locations. There's a bin out front. Are you talking to me? I got a question. <laughs> Pretend I'm very much brand new. Can you please share what Red Day is? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I put the description in the event. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just that our it's our day of giving where we give back to the communities that we serve in. So we don't do real estate and we go out and we work in our communities. So when you say Color we're talking about Color yeah, yes. Keller Williams all over the world shuts world their world. offices and gets back to their communities. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and yeah. what is five? What does that represent? That's that's May 9th. I know, but isn't that? <laughs> that's it's no, it's no, no, no Anderson's birthday. birthday. Yeah. Well, Red Day is started on her birthday. It doesn't always yes. land on her birthday, but yes. But yes. Yeah. It's actually the third. So yeah, the link trees. So the link trees. So there's a multi-service center. There's nine line. There's, but there'll be a um, a sign up genius for any one of those volunteer opportunities, or there'll be an Amazon wish list or a Venmo to donate money. So it should be pretty user friendly. Um, and if it isn't, you can always reach out to me or Jackie or ask questions in the event. Um, but yeah, it's all there. Yes. And so our special guest is also part of one of the organizations we're going to be volunteering at for Red Day, but also this year's auction recipient. So I'm going to welcome Erica Thompson. She's the founder of The Wishing Well, and she's going to share a little bit about this. That's it. Yep. Okay. Well, I'll make this quick because I know you guys are probably all hungry and have had a lot of knowledge poured into you, but... Um, so my husband and I started the wishing well in 2011. Um, it came from our journey where foster, we became foster parents in 2008 and very quickly um, realized that kids were showing up with just the clothes on their back. Um, so thought what an easy thing to do to collect, um, you know, clothing and other items uh, to pass along to the kids and then my fellow foster parent friends. Um, so it really branched from there. Our garage suddenly filled up and the boat moved out and the cars moved out. My husband, in order to save our marriage, my husband, uh, my parents gave, just kidding, but my parents <laughs> gave us, they had a rental. And so they said, why don't you go ahead and use this and do the wishing well out of there. Um, and we became a nonprofit because some people didn't have children at home to give us their belongings. They said, we want to give you money. So we became a 501c3. And so it kind of um, branched from there. Um, we have had over 130 foster children just through our home and um, just saw that the need was so great. And I'm kind of one of those instead of just complaining about it, because there was nothing in Pierce County to support families. I thought, well, let's let's go and do this. Since then, it's, it's grown to so much more. Uh, we are not funded by the state. A lot of people think, like, don't you get funding you know, from foster care in the state to do that. No, we rely on community donations. We have a grant writer um, and it's just all, just my husband and I and, you know, the volunteers that help us do this. Um, but we feel pretty impactful. We have, we started out with just clothing and then there were some funders that wanted to just do, um, they didn't want to do the clothing. They wanted to do enrichment activities. So we created a little wishes program we pay for sports, music, anything that really, um, you know, can kind of connect a child with maybe that person that will take them under their wings. We know it just takes one successful, you know, adult to kind of change the trajectory of a kid's life. So we have the Little Wishes program. Um, we do monthly events. A lot of times our foster youth are placed into different homes. And so they know they can count on this one event each month where they can be come together. So like this month, we've rented out to five in Tacoma and it's just for foster families, just for the kids so they can go wild. And if they're, you know, having behaviors, no one's judging you because sometimes the community, they don't get that our kids might've just had a visit or had a really hard day or got bad news at court or whatever. So um, we do monthly events. We have a back to school event. We have a Christmas event, um, a grad event, uh, which is what I think we're going to be doing the Amazon wish list. So 
Um, it's really annoying to me, but I'm happy to fill that gap that the state does nothing for yeah. our grads. I mean, yeah. our grads deserve, it's, it's amazing if any youth graduates in this day and age, really, with all the obstacles and mental health, you know, all the things that they've kind of gone through, and then to be a youth in foster care and not be celebrated. So we do a big event for them. And um, so there's that. And then we're really focusing more and more now because of all the homelessness and um, unhoused youth, we have really amped up our programs for the 18 to 21. When children age out of foster care, they used to just kind of be like, adios, but now they're able to sign back into care until they're 21 and receive still not great services, but something rather. So um, we're able to help with rent, car repairs. We're kind of like the surrogate parent, if you will, um, because they don't have those people like a lot of us did to lean on. And I mean, one flat tire could suddenly cause them to become unhoused, right? They don't have, like, my daughters will call me up and, Mom, I need this, I need that, and we're able to do that. So just this morning, um, I paid for a youth and his younger brother hotel to stay in until the department can find them some housing. So they're kind of in one of those extended stays. Um, anyway, so there's that. Um, this Saturday will be our first time. Um, I've been meeting a lot of the youth that tell me they get food stamps, but it runs out towards the end of the month. And so I thought, well, what can we do to try to help that? So this Saturday we have right now, we have only 10 spots because, um, we're going to, it's a pilot program, but 10 youth that are going to come, we're providing the crock pot and the Tupperware to all the meat and ingredients for two meals so spaghetti and meatballs and southwest chicken tacos giving them a gas card because that can be a barrier and we're always about removing the barrier so whether they don't have gas to get there or they need someone to give them a ride we're giving them 25 dollars and this is just at south hill baptist in puyallup so all my stuff is local to our county um and they get to come in and get those meals and i'm hoping it will build then the next, they'll send my husband, we have a partnership with Puyallup Food Bank. So he's going and getting some supplemental non-perishable items just to really help them through this last, the last week of the month or two, because a lot of times they're just, they don't have anything to eat. Um, so there's that. And the, another, the last program that I just created is um, a program for African, to pay for African-American hair care, because a lot of our kids come into care there's a lot of disproportionality in their place, you know, with white families that don't know how to do the hair. Um, it's, it's, you know, really, I think a stressful time anyway, to be in foster care, you're going to a new school switching. So um, the department always has said, oh, let us, you know, we can put the provider in our system and they can do a consultation and then we can, it just takes way too long. So we're just paying immediately for the kids to get it done um, because it is expensive. My daughter gets braids and it's $200 and, you know, a lot of foster families, don't want to spend that or they if it's a kinship caregiver they don't have the funds to so we we're just trying to always see like where we can change and help and be you know effective so i know it's a lot of information all at once but yeah <laughs> Erica. So yeah. yeah really quickly so on red day one of the things that we're specifically doing is putting together graduation lays mm -hmm. and so when you Yay. see that on the link tree when we're asking for monetary donations we are actually going to take cash out from those donations to be to be to make the lays so that is what that cash is immediately going to their money lays and we're doing 80 right like yeah. 80 money lays and 80 candy lays so we need a lot of money to so send yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Like yep go ahead is there any sort of job training program or anything for the kids that are maybe between 16 and 21 or 18 and 21 or any available <laughs> situations within your organization that have that to offer? So we have not done that yet. Um, we have held a couple. So I received a grant from the Puyallup Tribe. It was to host um, resource fairs. So I've been, we've held three now and they've been super successful. Um, part of the thing with this crock pot meals, I'm hoping, is that I can... Uh, get the kids engaged. A lot of them know me because they've been in care since 15 and up. And they, I mean, they call me all the time. Like, I don't know who my social worker is because they are always quitting and changing. Um, my hope is that I can start to do something where then I can plug in, like have a realtor come and speak, at, you know, make them stay right now. I'm just saying you come from one to two, get the crock pot and you can in stuff and you can leave. But I'm hoping I can start to do something where we can like, sort of instill knowledge in them in job, more job training, because I don't have a program for that. And 
I don't know if a lot would show up technically. I mean, they connect with Bates and Clover Park and all those, but I want to do things too, where it's more like kind of like a workshop, right? And it may not interest them. It may um, teach all how to do budgeting and things yes, like that. Yes, and get like right around tax season because we've had kids come to our house. They'll call like, I don't know what to do. And my husband, they come to our house, they have dinner. <laughs> they, you know, it's kind of my kids are like, who's that kid there? I'm like, oh, well, you know. <laughs> so, but it's again, we like, I, I really love being a mom to many. And so, um, yes, that is in my future. But my husband's like, can't we just focus on what we're doing now? As well, <laughs> no, I will volunteer my services for okay. something of that nature. And if yeah. anyone wants to join me, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Sounds really good. Yeah, I've learned a lot today. I mean, more than I ever knew. About. <laughs> <laughs> Inner workings, right? Like, I feel it's really awesome. exciting. And if you don't have a save the date for the auction, it is October 26th, Saturday at Farm 12. So save the date, put it on your calendar. And then real quickly before we guys let you go, Hillary, you guys are doing a cocktails and conversations on on um, So our hosts are Katie Tobin, uh color uh, and she is uh, sponsoring as well as Jamal Hatcher. It's on my phone here. I thought it was coming up there. I can't see that. Uh, JK Handyman. And so they are sponsoring our event. They're going to help build us on a vinegar and better business. And we're about inclusion and belonging. So this is our first networking event. And I also want to thank everybody who participated in the survey. We are taking your comments, results, and feedback and putting it into our GPS for a second and third quarter. And Nicole Larson was the winner of our game party. Love that. Nice. So, upcoming training, always on the calendar. You guys can either have a paper calendar, you guys can have a link, and it'll, each month it will update. And then, there's a link for the upcoming training one if you don't have it already. And then this is updated. And this is updated Yay! now. So while you guys get food, update. Go forth. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.